John Glenn. I'm the lonesome Marine on this outfit. America needs heroes. I got on this project because it'd probably be the nearest to heaven I'd ever get. He's genuine, he's sincere, and what you see is real. Would you like to be the first man to reach the moon? Well, sure, I'd like to go to the moon, George. Uh, but I think like any other test pilot, I'd sure like to check out all the equipment before we started a trip like that. He's the kid who really gets excited about airplanes and rockets. John is a tremendous and focused competitor. Name this tune. John Glenn would be the first to admit that he was a sniveler. To snivel in the military is to be kind of a scrambler. been there wants to go back. He's a genuine American hero. His dreams would take him to the heavens. But long before he took flight, John Glenn had both feet on the ground in a place that taught him how to work and how to dream. It is America's heartland, southeastern Ohio. Here, early in the 20th century, life was simple. Neighbors were treated like family, and families built their lives around faith. Our whole social life evolved around our churches and our schools, and we were very proud people, and uh, helped each other, knew everyone, and it was just kind of a little quiet place. It was into this storybook setting that John Herschel Glenn Jr. was born on July 18, 1921. His father, John Sr., known as Herschel, was a plumber. His mother, Clara, was a Sunday school teacher. When John was two years old, his family settled in New Concord, the Glens began each day by reading from the Bible. Probably Glenn's parents instilled in him if uh, two things, a, uh, a feeling from Clara that all people are worthy of respect, and from his father he got a tremendous work ethic. But young John would also let his imagination take flight. By the early 1930s, his idols included Charles Lindbergh and the Wright brothers. He spent countless afternoons building model airplanes. And whenever the Glenn family visited the nearby city of Columbus, John pleaded to go to the local airport. He would watch airplanes take off and land for hours. But his head wasn't just in the clouds. Taught to be responsible and hardworking, John also had a talent to lead. He helped start a club called the Rangers, modeled after the Boy Scouts. John led the group on trips camping out under the stars. And then that's when you'd talk about the, you know, look up at the stars and wonder about the future. Is anybody's ever going to go to the moon? And I'm sure John was in on those too. He said, well, we think, no, no, nobody will ever get there. John in those days had more earthly interests. He was smitten with a young girl named Annie Castor. She was a year older than he was. The two became soulmates. Annie and I never have known a time we did not know each other. We were in the playpen together. Eventually, the storybook childhood they shared blossomed into a fairy tale romance. And we grew up together, and, and uh, oh, then about the time we're starting in high school, we started dating. It was a case of true love, no doubt about that. Most people like to play the field, but they, they didn't at all. John was devoted to Annie and accepted her totally, even her halting, awkward stutter. John's father ran a local car dealership, and so the young suitor squired Annie around New Concord in a Chevrolet Roadster, complete with a rumble seat. Very, very few 
kids had their own cars. So it was fun to see them going past, and of course you knew that was John and Annie. This car also gave John a chance to pursue his other passion, danger. Glenn's uh, probably biggest vice then was uh, racing the old jalopy that he had a little too fast. He used to call it shooting the bridge. Probably the first time that John Glenn uh, went into space was when, he, when, he, when the wheels left the road uh, over that bridge. John still managed to keep both feet on the ground. At school, he excelled in math and science. But with his stout, chunky legs, he was not a natural athlete. Still, he believed that if he worked hard enough, he could succeed. And he did, lettering in three sports, football, basketball, and tennis. In the fall of 1939, John followed Annie to local Muskingum College. His parents thought college would prepare him to take over the family plumbing business. But John didn't want his dreams to go down the drain. He began taking flying lessons at a nearby airport. The mad dog of Europe has at last plunged civilization into a new world war. Nazi troops have invaded Poland by land and by air in undeclared war. While the world began to talk more of war, John prepared to become a military pilot. I was proud of my ability and loved it. And once I got started flying, I didn't want to do much else. His parents, however, were dead set against the idea of him being a military pilot because, as his father said, we might as well have just taken our son out and buried him. December 1941, Pearl Harbor pulls America into the war and pulls John into another date with danger. The excitement of battle was calling him. Defying his parents, he dropped out of college and enlisted. A year later, he graduated from Naval Aviation School. One night, a visiting Marine recruiter told the young officers that no one in the group looked like Marine material. It's like waving a red flag in front of a bull and Glenn signed up right then, that night, and thus began John Glenn's career as a marine aviator. John graduated, went back to New Concord, and of course immediately married his lifelong sweetheart, Annie Castor. On April 6, 1943, John and Annie were married. Once upon a time, they seemed destined to live happily ever after in Ohio, but no more. Ohio seemed a distant memory to a young man with a taste for adventure and a love of danger. New Marine aviator John was assigned to El Centro Air Station in California. Not long after arriving there, he met an authentic American hero, his boyhood idol, Charles Lindbergh. The legendary pilot had arrived at the base in a Corsair, a new plane that John had seen but never flown. John and a friend wasted no time. They asked if they could try it out. And I was amazed. He said, sure. When do you want to fly it? And uh, so John and I looked at each other, and he said, well, we'll go to get our parachutes right now, and we'll be right back. That kind of brashness and ability to impress the right people would take John far. Some would call it audacious. Career military officers call it sniveling. John Glenn would be the first to admit that he was a sniveler. To snivel in the military is to be kind of a scrounger or a scrambler. That is to say, someone who can take the cards that are dealt to him and use them in a way that will work to his advantage. John Glenn played his cards masterfully. But every hand he was dealt would involve a gamble, and the brash pilot was about to face the biggest gamble of his young life. By 1944, as the Second World War raged, 23-year-old John Glenn 
had chosen to make a career out of the Marines. After 10 months of training in California, he was assigned overseas to Midway Island in the Pacific. Glenn's squadron was to protect the island's submarine base from Japanese attack. You've trained for strafing runs, you know exactly what to do, you know what your target is, and you're there to hit it, knock it out. The Midway duty was as dangerous and as frightening as any flying mission in the Pacific. There'd just be explosions going off all over the place, and uh, you would uh, you'd know that if one of those hit directly on your plane, why, uh, that could be very, very serious. But the risks invigorated Glenn. Each flight was a challenge, a chance to push himself to new limits and perhaps defy the odds. Glenn flew 59 missions during World War II and was awarded three Distinguished Flying Crosses, among the highest decorations a pilot can earn. He was a natural aviator. Uh, he didn't have to work at flying, and uh, he certainly didn't have any fear. Peacetime gave the Glens a chance to start a family. Son David was born in September of 1945. In March 1947, Carolyn arrived. But Glenn's peaceful life of home and family could not last. In 1950, war broke out in Korea. The decorated pilot knew where he belonged. He headed off once more to combat in the new F-86 Sabre jet. A new American plane has arrived in Korea, the F-86 Sabre jet. Top speed, 670 miles per hour in level flight. But Glenn and the other pilots faced a powerful and frightening adversary, the Soviet-made MiGs. Their appearance and performance are a shock to Americans. Some of their capabilities are far better than our best fighter planes. The MiG is a more maneuverable airplane than the F-86. There, he was, uh, of course, naturally trying to see how many MiGs he could uh, shoot down. In the last seven days of the war, uh, he got three MiGs. Uh, he was uh, called the MiG Mad Marine and to the extent they even painted it on the side of his airplane. Again and again, one of America's most decorated pilots defied gravity and death, flying more than 90 missions in Korea. The skies became his second home, risking all for his country became his greatest reward. The risk didn't end with the 1953 ceasefire. Peacetime became an excuse to try another dangerous job. Glenn decided to become a test pilot. On July 16, 1957, Glenn boarded a supersonic jet and began a record-breaking flight from California to New York. The trip involved more than speed. It also involved danger. The flight required two risky mid-air refuelings. I have to come back down then to about 25,000 feet and rendezvous with the uh, tanker. And we didn't have radar or anything to do that. You had to eyeball it. You had to find the tanker and, and see it and then uh, slow down enough to come up and then plug in and, and refuel. But Glenn did it. Flying more than 1,000 miles an hour, he made the trip in record time, just over three hours and 23 minutes. The dreamer from Ohio had made history, and waiting for him at Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn were his family and a congratulatory message from his hero, Charles Lindbergh. Glenn enjoyed the spotlight and soon warmed to it. 
He even appeared on the nationally televised game show, Name That Tune. For the $25,000. Nine seconds. You have nine seconds. From the Indian love lyrics by Amy Woodford Pinden. Name this tune. <laughs> You know the name of that song? Kashmiri Love Song. Kashmiri Song, it's good! He won $25,000, which made quite a difference in the budget of a military man. In late 1957, the Cold War would give Glenn an opportunity to shine. The Soviet Union had put into orbit a satellite called Sputnik. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik. The space race was on. Within months, the United States intensified its own crash development program to build a spacecraft. One secret part of the project was to build a vehicle that could hold a man. Glenn, one of the most celebrated test pilots, seemed a natural, but there was a problem. He thought he was too tall and too heavy for the astronaut program. Glenn dieted strenuously and walked around for days at a time with books on his head to compress his height. Amazingly, it worked. On April 9, 1959, the Mercury astronauts were introduced, the men chosen to lead the country to a new frontier. Today we are introducing to you and to the world these seven men who have been selected to begin training for orbital space flight. Everybody wanted to know about them, there were stories about them. Uh, they were quite a colorful group, and from the very beginning you knew that John Glenn was the leader of this group. Every one of us would feel guilty, I think, if we didn't make the fullest use of our talents in volunteering for something that is as important as this is to our, our country and the world in general right now. I was quite glad to be selected. I thought it was a new area. Uh, I had enjoyed doing what I was doing in test work. And this was a new challenge, to say the least. The astronauts got down to business. Training was a grueling process. Tests were designed to simulate the conditions of space flights. Glenn and the others saw themselves pushed to the limit. We learned an awful lot about the human organism and its adaptability to all sorts of stresses. Nobody knew whether the machines could do it. Nobody knew for sure that the men could do it. But in spite of his senior status among the astronauts, Glenn wasn't selected to pilot the first Mercury mission. NASA chose Alan Shepard for the initial suborbital flight. The Redstone rocket is ready. The Mercury capsule is ready. Commander Alan Shepard, our astronaut, is ready. The weather is good. Let it off. Shepard made history on May 5, 1961, becoming the first American in space. A second launch was scheduled for June, but again, Glenn was passed over. The man who had achieved everything he wanted, who had fulfilled every dream, found this goal out of reach. He was overcome by a sense of failure and depression. Tom Miller finally had to say to him, look, get a grip. You've worked damn hard for this, and you're in this program. You're harming yourself, and you're harming your family. Soon, the clouds over Glenn's life would part. He was selected to pilot the third suborbital flight. But on August 6, 1961, the Soviets rewrote the rules by orbiting the Earth about 16 times. The U.S. had no choice but to escalate the third Mercury mission to also orbit the Earth. By chance, Glenn would become the first American to do it. As NASA prepared Glenn for his mission, the astronaut prepared his family. He wanted them to know there was a chance he might never return. It was a 
remarkable kind of thing for a father to do, and yet it was also probably the best thing for him to do. They were prepared if the worst were to happen. The fear of failure was only prolonged by the wait. The launch was scrubbed 10 times because of technical problems and uncooperative weather. Then, in the pre-dawn hours of February 20th, 1962, Glenn prepared for another launch attempt. I don't know any words for this except the trite ones. Tension is mounting here at Cape Canaveral. We've heard that phrase so many times before, but I don't know any circumstance to which it applies quite like this. It was such a relief to really get going. All systems were go. It appeared there would be no further delays. NASA's mission control gave the go-ahead to begin the final countdown. All the training and, and all the hopes to be on the mission and what we were going to learn was finally underway. Glenn spoke to his wife Annie over a special line from the cockpit and used their coded goodbye. I'm going to the corner for some gum, he said. Don't be long, she told him. Sitting atop a 200-foot Atlas rocket, John Glenn listened as the gantry pulled away. The final countdown began, a countdown into the heavens and into history. Good Lord, ride all the way. Godspeed, John Glenn. John Glenn had dreamed of soaring in the skies. Now at age 40, he was about to reach for the stars. The boy who loved Lindbergh had grown into a man about to write his own chapter in history. February 20th, 1962. At 9.47 a.m., as the world watched, Glenn's rocket lifted off the launch pad into the sky. Roger, backup clock is started. Looks like a good flight. Oh, go, baby. MA6 vehicle is still climbing nicely. Within minutes, Friendship 7 had reached the speed and altitude necessary to begin circling the Earth. Glenn navigated the capsule's course using rudimentary charts. Glenn took photographs of his home planet. He was experiencing both a sunrise and a sunset about every 90 minutes. Glenn was awestruck by the beauty and the magnitude of what he saw. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Exultant would be a mere shadow of a word to describe how he felt when he was in space the first time. The sight of the home planet from this new point of view is a transcending experience. You, you see the grand order of things at work makes you think of the grand order of things. And it's a marvelous experience if you want to pay attention to your soul. Go, our capsule is in good shape. In orbit, Glenn began working through the checklist of scientific experiments assigned to the mission. Cabin pressure holding five, six at present time. And uh, preparing to take final still at present time. But he was soon interrupted by questions about an indicator light on his control panel. Glenn began to suspect what NASA already knew. He had a serious problem, potentially a dangerous one. Uh, will you confirm that your landing bag switch is in the off position, over? Uh, that is affirmative. Landing bag switch is in the center off position. 
Ground Control feared that the space capsule's landing bag might open before re-entry. If it did, it could loosen the ship's protective heat shield. The result would be disaster. The capsule would burn up with Glenn trapped inside. There was no way to tell whether or not this was a false indication on the control panel or whether in fact Glenn was in mortal danger. During the course of the flight, the ground control was held off telling this to Glenn. Mission Control asked Glenn to flip the landing bag switch and check the problem. Uh, this is Bridge Ship 7. Now, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. Not at this time. This is the judgment of safe flight. All right, Roger. Say if you had your instructions, please. Over. So, holding his breath and I suspect whispering a prayer, flicked the switch. It's showing negative, Houston. And basically, Houston said, Whew. The immediate crisis had passed, and Glenn began his descent back to Earth. He was about to go into a blackout period, during which mission control would lose contact with their pilot for several minutes. He didn't know what to expect. Coming down on 10, circles are open. I wasn't sure when all these pieces came back by the window, these burning chunks, whether it was the uh, retro pack or the heat shield that was breaking up. So that made for a very spectacular re-entry. My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. Beautiful, shoot. It looks good. Friendship 7 landed safely in the Atlantic Ocean. The capsule was recovered by the naval destroyer NOAA. Glenn returned to Earth with a splash. Wave after wave of praise greeted him. America had a new hero, a hero for the space age. His performance in fulfillment of this most dangerous assignment reflects the highest credit upon himself and the United States. Friendship 7, though, is just the beginning. It is another plateau in our step-by-step -step program of increasingly ambitious flights. Local boy makes good. Colonel John Glenn returns to New Concord, Ohio for a reception by the hometown folks. Climax to the acclaim he has had from Cape Canaveral to New York. Upwards of 50,000 people jammed into this town, which has a population of 2,100. And the home folks have even further ambitions for the hero. The last great reception for the astronaut. Now it's back to work on the space program. The ticker tape and the tributes could never match the glorious rush Glenn felt when soaring through the skies. He wanted desperately to fly again, to put himself on the line, to test his own limits in space. But his NASA bosses kept putting him off. The cover story for that was that President Kennedy was said to be afraid that he might be killed and he was a national hero. My own sense of it is that also in there was a little fear by Jack Kennedy that John Glenn might run for president or might have political aspirations someday. President Kennedy did have plans for John Glenn and they would launch this pilot into an entirely new orbit. At 40, John Glenn had become a true American hero. Still, he yearned to fly once more in space, to slip the bonds of Earth again. But the flight pattern of his life was about to change. Bobby Kennedy had approached uh, John about running for the Senate in Ohio. Towards the end of Kennedy's first term, he was looking towards the election that was coming up. Ohio was a very, very important state. Politics had always intrigued Glenn. But soon a cruel reality would send the pilot crashing to Earth. The Kennedy assassination devastated Glenn, but it also gave him a renewed sense of purpose a deeper desire to serve. 
purpose of this meeting then is to declare myself a candidate for the Democratic nomination for United States Senator from the state of Ohio. But the race was over almost before it began. While shaving, Glenn fell against a bathtub, fracturing his inner ear. He was rushed to the hospital. Doctors said the injury would heal, but a full recovery would take months. He could not overcome the nausea that resulted from that fall and the damage to his inner ear. And I tried to tell him to press on, but he couldn't. He simply couldn't. The man who had conquered space had been defeated by a simple accident. He called reporters to his bedside and withdrew from the race. The accident made Glenn realize that if anything happened to him, his family wouldn't be provided for. He soon changed that. With his political career aborted before liftoff, Glenn went to work as an executive for the Royal Crown Cola Company and he began investing in real estate. But in 1966, Glenn's financial success was followed by personal loss with the death of his father. Two years later in 1968, Bobby Kennedy's murder dealt Glenn another blow. Now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. John Glenn had the terrible duty of telling the Kennedy children that their father was dead. Not many people could do as well as he did at that particular time. Glenn still felt a calling to work in politics. In 1974, he ran for the Senate once again. This time, with assistance from Jackie Kennedy Onassis, he won. John Glenn, the astronaut, is a landslide winner in the Ohio Senate race uh, that he will win with over 70% of the vote when all the votes are tabulated there. Once in Washington, the freshman senator hunkered down to work with his trademark determination. He generally supported his party, uh, but I never really, uh, as I think back on him, and remember him for any particular issues. I just remember him for being a very decent man, a very honest man. After Watergate, some thought Glenn's honesty could pave the way to the White House. But at the 1976 Democratic Convention, the man who had mesmerized Congress with the tales of his orbital flight bombed. We are meeting tonight to carry on the American Revolution. A revolution begun two centuries ago as brave Americans committed themselves to a new hope, a hope for freedom, and the hope that in freedom, the bounty of this land would be plenty for, for all. That speech killed his chances for the nomination. Glenn was branded with every politician's most dreaded label, boring. But the Glenn who had lettered in three sports by sheer will also believed he could make it to the White House. In 1984, he went home to Ohio, the birthplace of eight U.S. presidents, and announced his plan. It's a time to begin setting goals again for this country. It's a time to challenge the American people. This is John Glenn. To give their best. It's a time, in short, for our nation to once again reach for greatness. John Glenn for president. Believe in the future again. Among eight candidates, Glenn and former Vice President Walter Mondale were the top prospects. Glenn's two grown children hit the trail to stump for their dad. We just decided uh, whatever uh, unpleasant aspects of, of being in the limelight or being a part of a presidential family would be worth it. In an instance of political good timing, the movie version of Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff was released as the primary season was beginning. The movie, like the book, glorified the early astronauts. Actor Ed Harris portrayed Glenn. There was a lot of comment at the time that this was going to be uh, his ticket to the presidency. But even Hollywood couldn't help. 
Mondale's campaign was strong and directed. Glenn's campaign was poorly organized and underfunded. His message muddled and unconvincing. John Glenn's speaking style is, uh, is the speaking style of a test pilot. <laughs> He's not going to win any oratorical contests. Uh, somehow he gets, he gets going sometimes and you wonder where is this going. After 11 long months, Glenn withdrew from the race. I hope those who have supported me will not end their participation in our political process. He returned to the Senate, but in 1990, stories began to appear that Glenn and four other legislators had interceded with federal regulators to help a corrupt banker, Charles Keating. Keating later became the focus of major savings and loan scandals that cost Americans billions of dollars. The evidence was overwhelming that neither John Glenn nor John McCain had anything to do with that. They went to a meeting, and after the meeting, they, they didn't like what they heard and saw, and that's all they had to do with it. Glenn's relationship with Keating consisted of just two meetings, and at worst, showed poor judgment rather than impropriety. But in all the uproar, the subtle truth was lost. Everything I did in this was not only legal, I believe it was moral, it was ethical. And thus Glenn have, uh, uh, paid, a, I think, a, a terrible price uh, uh, for essentially innocently attending a meeting. It affected him very deeply. I think that hurt John very bad because it reflected on uh, his own integrity and his own honesty to the American people. I think he's gotten better accepting it uh, as the years gone by. Uh, you might say he's developed a thicker skin. A tougher, wearier John Glenn stood for re-election in 1992. He would return to the Senate for one last term, but he had one more journey to make. John Glenn wanted to reach toward the stars once again, and this time he knew a way to get there. By 1996, John Glenn was one of the Senate's senior statesmen recognized for his groundbreaking work with nuclear non-proliferation and government efficiency. But at this moment, with the sun setting on his political career, he saw the dawning of a new opportunity and another chance to serve. In the Senate, Glenn had been curious about how spaceflight might affect the aging process. Muscle breakdown occurs for different reasons maybe than just uh, lack of exercise. Things like that occur that have a similarity to the natural process of aging right here on Earth. Glenn thought that scientific tests could be conducted in space to see how an older astronaut's body would fare. And he knew the perfect guinea pig. After all, Glenn had been there before. At 74, he was still within 10 pounds of his weight for the Mercury flight more than 30 years earlier. So Glenn paid a call on NASA Administrator Dan Golden. The first time it was said it was as a joke. I didn't think anything of it. I knew it was real serious. He had called to have lunch with me. And as soon as we started, he took out these books. And he said, I've been doing research on aging. I always did want to go back up again not only for a personal experience of going back up, but I really am truly excited about the science that may benefit a lot of people out of this. Soon, NASA began to take the proposal seriously. The dogged persistence that had helped Glenn at every stage of his career surfaced once again. He lobbied hard behind the scenes to prove he still had the right stuff. I felt there wouldn't be much of a chance he'd get through those gates. I didn't know the intensity and the commitment of John Glenn. <laughs> but while Glenn kept his eye on the stars, there were more earthbound problems to contend with. In the summer of 1997, Glenn was the senior Democrat on a committee investigating how the 1996 presidential campaigns were financed. 
It fell to him to defend Bill Clinton and the Democrats' questionable fundraising. You say then that if I could just he knew he was going to retire from the Senate uh, at the end of this term. Uh, He saw it as his duty uh, to try to give the Democrats uh, side of this, and and uh, I'm not sure he was always happy with that. I don't think those hearings were very well handled on either side. Uh, I thought sometimes John was too much of an apologist for the administration. Uh, My response is that we tried to cover up nothing. Uh, We didn't try and take on the uh, contrary to what they, uh, the word they had put out during the hearings that uh, we were not doing nothing but representing the White House. I had no contact with the White House all during the hearings. The hearings did little to burnish Glenn's image, but soon NASA would do that for him. It decided to let him go once more into space. The man who had made history in 1962 by becoming the first American to orbit the Earth would make history again in 1998 as the oldest man ever to travel in space. He was thrilled. I am extremely proud to announce that John Glenn of Ohio, the first American to orbit the Earth, will get his long-awaited and much deserved second flight. And I saw him in the hall uh, right after it happened. And I said, I think you're still just a test pilot. And he said, you're right, I am. Glenn began intensive training. The technology had changed in 30 years, but something more important had not. Glenn's passion for flying, for taking off into the great unknown. In his heart, He was still the boy who built model planes in Ohio. Okay, here we go. John Glenn's enthusiasm was contagious, giving the space program a much needed shot in the arm. For the first time in years, the public became curious and excited about a man going into space. I think that's great. I think it'd be really cool. I hope that I can do what he's going to do when I'm 77. With that liftoff, the circle would close. Another sunrise and sunset in the twilight of an extraordinary life. He was the kid that would be elected class president. He would be the first one you'd think of in high school to, you know, hit up the safety patrol. Uh, He really was Mr. Mr. Real Stuff. I've never seen such a positive human being. The more obstacles that went into his path, the more determined he became. It's just a tremendous feeling that you have when you have someone like John as an example. I think his life has been pretty well filled with snivels and he's always won. He was able to reignite in the American people that can-do feeling. He was, in fact, the last American hero.